Good evening, everyone. My name is Lenore Naxon. I'm part of the Arts and Ideas team here at the JCC. And welcome to the opening event of our JCCSF 2014-15 Arts and Ideas season. Here, here, that's right. Tonight's presentation will be available via webcast, archived on our website for future viewing, and scheduled on our KALW 91.7 FM weekly radio program, BINA. Now's the time I tell you to turn off everything that rings, beeps, or vibrates. I hope that you filled out one of these forms uh, and given us your email address. We enter these names into a weekly drawing and winners receive free tickets to upcoming events, so it's a good value. Our grateful thanks to our co-sponsors for tonight, to Byright Market, to Quesa, <laughs> Hazan, and our wonderful bookseller, Omnivore Books, um, who all came together to make this evening possible. Thank you so much. I hope you all got a chance to sample some of the delicious treats outside, yum, that were made available by our co-sponsors on your way in. So if you can't tell by my accent, I'm originally from Chicago, <laughs> where apple harvest signals the chill in the air, cinnamon sticks in warm cider, and a plethora of beautiful Midwest varietals. Now, I've been in San Francisco for a long time and found that even though here September means summer, it also means an extraordinary array of splendid locally grown apples. I went to the Marin Farmer's Market yesterday and was just overjoyed at the range of choice there. I always look forward to this time of year to the delight of dipping tart pippins and Granny Smiths in honey for Rosh Hashanah. Rowan just told me he's been asked to do some apple and honey pairings for Rosh Hashanah this year, something that I hadn't thought of before. And it's the wonderful opportunity to take big, crunchy bites of beautiful, sweet apples that abound at Byright and all the other local Marcos, although we all know that there's nothing like Byright, right? Absolutely. So it's just fitting that we start our fall season with a celebration of apples and with Rowan Jacobson. His love affair with apples began when he bought an old farmhouse in Vermont and discovered the mysterious old apple trees on the property. Soon, he was making his own hard cider and learning that there was far more to the fruit with the great range than we would ever learn from what we find in a supermarket. Apples of Uncommon Character is his celebration of the incredible diversity and utility, Malus Domestica. Did I say it right? Oh, well, thank you. A two-time James Beard Award winner and perennial presence in the Best Food Writing Anthology, he writes for Orion, Mother Jones, Harper's, Outside, Yankee, and many other publications. His other books include A Geography of Oysters, for those of us who like Traif, <laughs> like me, Fruitless Fall in American Terroir, Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Rowan Jacobson. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out on a Monday night. And Lenore, thank you for that fantastic introduction. And uh, also, I, Lenore really had the vision to, to bring all the pieces of this together, the apples, the cider. So how about a round of applause for the, for the vision? That was an a amazing spread of apples out there. It was really a treat to see that. Did anyone try the Ashfeen's kernel? Actually, I was really excited. Isn't that a fantastic apple? That's, that's, that is the taste right there of southern England circa 1700. That was when that apple was first discovered. And uh, they, they went wild for it but, uh, 300 years ago. So, and that, so that is exactly, when you taste that, you're tasting exactly what uh, the English apple geeks were excited about 300 years ago. So it's kind of fun to make that connection. Well, I, I'm going to immediately uh, change, change course from my plan and uh, ask you guys something. Um, so favorites, what did you have out there that you liked? You just shout it out. Hawaiian. I've, I've never seen that apple before. That's, uh, that's new for me out here. Yeah, yeah. That is a... What was that? 
Sweet surprise. The, the pink surprise? Honey crisp. The, as I call it, the 800 pound gorilla in the apple industry right now. <laughs> That's the, uh, the pink surprise, yeah. For anyone who didn't, um, afterward, take a look. It's, um, it's really fun to, to surprise people with those because it looks like a regular green apple on the outside and you let someone take a bite out of it and it's like something out of a fairy tale, you know? It's like bright pink inside. And Jonathan, one of the all-time classics, considered one of the greatest tasting apples that America ever produced. Used in a lot of uh, breeding programs because it's got that really distinctive apple flavor. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for a Gravenstein vote there. I was surprised to uh, not hear it. Oh, oh, okay. That's a good point. Ashmead's Colonel? <laughs> I might have bought them out a little early. Oh, it wasn't any good. <laughs> um, well, so uh, I guess like that actually is a kind of is the point I wanted to talk about tonight, and part of the reason I wrote my book is um, because I, I, when I started learning about apples, and, and especially some of the heirlooms, but also the modern varieties, maybe 10 to 12 years ago, I was amazed at this incredible diversity that was out there that I really had not known about, being a normal kid growing up in the, you know, in the 70s. I was red delicious, golden delicious. Then Granny Smith came along and was the wild and crazy apple in the room. And, in New England, we had Macintosh, too, but that was about it. Wine saps, a uh, big, big apple in the south. Uh, we never used to see those up in New England. Do you guys see wine saps out here ever? Super famous. The apple that kind of saved the south back in the 1700s and then did, came out here and started the industry in the west coast and then got replaced by you-know-who. Uh, Red Delicious. The, uh, yeah, the Red Delicious is kind of like the fall guy in my story. And um, <laughs> Actually, somebody mentioned Gala out there. And uh, we're, um, I, just, I was having dinner with some of the, like, the big like, mega apple growers up in Washington State a few days ago. And they told me that we are kind of at a watershed moment, that they think this is actually going to be the year when Red Delicious, after ruling the roost since the 1950s at least, gets passed and is no longer the number one app sold apple in the country by Gala. So here's to Gala. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, so I guess my, yeah, my point is that um, ap the apple is this incredible entity that has this incredibly wide range, and we haven't been asking enough of it. It can do a lot of different things. Um, it's almost, it's like, and, and it's almost like if you had Robin Williams on your ensemble cast and you told him just be the straight man, right? Don't do any voices. The apple can do all kinds of voices and it's really entertaining when it does. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the voices it can do. It can be mysterious. It can be adorable. It can be classy. It can be sexy. It can be surprising like that pink surprise, and it can be downright freaky. <laughs> uh, this is an apple called a knobbed russet that's also from England in the 1800s, and um, that's how it looks, you know, when it's grown correctly. So there's no, I don't know, people have been propagating it for 200 years purely to freak out their friends as far as I can tell. <laughs> uh, so, and our, our ancestors 200 years ago would have totally known that the apple could be all kinds of different things, because they actually depended on it to be all kinds of different things. Right from the early colonial days, the apple was partnering with the colonists to make life on farms a whole lot sweeter than it would have been otherwise. Not only was it for fresh fruit, which is what we tend to associate it with, and for baking, but it also gave them a source of fruit throughout the year. There were certain apples that would come ripe in June and July, and there are other apples that you would pick them off the tree in November, hard as a rock. You, there's no way you could have eaten them. They were so sour at the time. 
but you put them in your root cellar for three or four months and took them out in the spring, and they would have just started to mellow up and become really nice and develop some interesting flavors that you wouldn't taste in a, normally in a fresh apple. So they really gave them a source of fruit throughout the year, but even more than that, they also gave them a way to get drunk throughout the year because the, uh, <laughs> the apple, until corn really came along and was grown in significant quantities and, and, and um, beer came along with that, the apple was, um, cider was the uh, standard tipple for everybody, man, woman, and child. It was low alcohol, maybe 4% alcohol, and safer than the water, and that was what everybody drank. Also, another one that people don't think about is uh, vinegar. Cider vinegar was a really important preservative back in the days pre-refrigeration. So the apple could be all kinds of different things, and a typical homestead would have grown probably a dozen varieties. And every region of the country would have had different varieties. So there was an incredible, incredible range of apples, but m there were no national apples back then. As you travel around the country, each town would have its own specialty apples that it was famous for. And uh, it was so you, you would really get a um, distinct flavor of the place through its apples wherever you went. And there's actually, I found this great quote by Henry Ward Beecher, who was uh, the abolition, abolitionist minister back around Civil War days, who also uh, was famous for his appetite and wrote a great essay about apple pie, which is well worth reading. It's really fun. And he, he described a typical New York cellar from the 1860s, which uh, it's really striking how uh, it, it makes you realize that people really knew what to do with apples back in the day. I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. On the east side stood a row of cider barrels, for 12 or 20 barrels of cider were a fit provision for the year, and what was not consumed for drink was expected duly to turn into vinegar, and was then exalted to certain hogsheads kept for the purpose. But along the middle of the cellar were the apple bins, and when the season had been propitious, there were stores and heaps of russets, greenings, seek no furthers, pear mains, gilliflowers, spitzenbergs, and many besides, nameless but not virtuous. All those varieties are still with us today actually. And to understand where all that diversity comes from, we have to talk a little bit about the birds and the bees, uh, chiefly the bees in this case, because uh, the really the important fact to understand about apples is that uh, apple seed, apples do not come true from seed. If you take a seed out of a red delicious and plant it, the tree that grows up will not have red delicious fruit. It'll have a different type of fruit than has ever existed before, because that seed is a genetically unique individual. Half its genes from its mother tree, and half from its father, who uh, was passed along uh, with, through the pollen via a bee. So just like we are, you know, we, we aren't identical to our parents, but we're a mix of the two things. True for an apple, but apples are very different than us. They have a lot of recessive traits, a lot of buried traits. So they tend to not resemble their parents remotely. It's almost like you took, if you had two full houses in, uh, in a card deck and you put them together and shuffled them and turned out cards randomly, you wouldn't have probably have an interesting hand at all. You wouldn't have a hand that was like the other hand. Apples are like that. Their genes are just shuffled so much with every seed that something totally new will come into being. And what happened in the colonies is that the uh, settlers didn't have wherewithal to tr for trees. They couldn't carry trees with them on their journeys as they were settling the frontier. They carried seeds. So this amazing genetic experiment took place with thousands or even hundreds of thousands of farmers planting millions of apple seeds, most famously Johnny Appleseed. Um, and all those trees were potentially new varieties of apples. Most of them were not very good. They were just sour green apples, and they'd go straight to the pigs or the fermentation barrel. But every now and then, one out of a hundred or one out of a thousand was something special. And when that happened, people would recognize it and they would take cuttings of it and graft it onto a rootstock so that it was genetically identical and then you had a new variety. They'd name it after the farmer they, who found it. And that's how all varieties have come into existence until breeding programs more recently. So when the apple hit America, it partnered with the colonists to create this amazing uh, genetic experiment and you never knew what you were going to get. But every single one was potentially the new Honeycrisp. 
And in fact, since there are still in the uh, old cellar holes and dirt roads of America, tons and tons of wild apple trees that have sprung up, undoubtedly there are several new honey crisps out there just waiting to be discovered and probably never will be, but you never know. Thoreau was a big, big apple head back in the day. And he had, so he had, uh, um, he also wrote a great essay about wild apples, and he had a quote sort of speaking to this like Dickensian one in a million uh, pos promise that every apple seed holds in it. So he said that every wild apple shrub excites our expectation thus, somewhat as every wild child. It is perhaps a prince in disguise. Who knows but this chance wild fruit, planted by a cow or a bird on some remote and rocky hillside where it is as yet unobserved by man, may be the choicest of all its kind, and far and potentate shall hear of it and royal societies seek to propagate it. Well, that's happened, and we, because people have paid close attention to apples, and because they're so long-lived, and they kind of have a lot of character, we've been able to tr trace some of these princes in disguise through history, from the time we know where the first tree came from. Rhode Island Greening, Newport, Rhode Island, 1640, still with us today. Baldwin, one of the uh, most famous apples America ever produced, born outside of Boston in the 1740s, and became such an important apple worldwide by 1900 that they actually erected a monument to Baldwin. Uh, it's, it's right in the Boston suburbs today, right? Not far out of town. You can go. There's a little, like, little, you know, park on a, on a street corner. All about the. This is the spot where the very first Baldwin tree came into being. So apples were a big deal. Esopus Spitzenberg, which uh, the old apple books have raved about for 200 years. Another one that's still with us. And I thought, I, there's one apple I wanted to tell its, its story in a little bit more uh, depth because I think of Newtown Pippin as the Forrest Gump of apples. It's, it somehow managed to you know, pop up in the, uh, in the photo you know, with more and more, like all these famous people through, from starting with colonial days. And it, it's sort of like, if you could tell a story of early America, you'd do pretty well to tell it through the Newtown Pippin. So here goes. It starts off, it's the only apple ever to have originated inside the uh, borders of New York City. Born in Queens in 1720. By 1740, it was the apple of Long Island, and it was actually the first apple that, uh, that commercial orchards started to grow. Uh, and somewhere in New York, Benjamin Franklin discovered the apple right around then and fell in love with the apple. <laughs> he thought it was the best apple he'd ever tasted, like many other people who've tasted it. This is the Pippin that uh, you guys know here, by the way, same apple. So uh, Franklin then was ambassador to England in the 1750s, introduced it to the British. He had barrels sent over with him, and they fell in love with it, and Pippin mania got started in England, and they started importing American apples. Uh, at the exact same time, a nasty little uh, event called the French and Indian War sprung up. I think this was like 1759 or something. And uh, this was in West, uh, western New York State, Pennsylvania, kind of that region, where the New, uh, Newtown Pippin was well known. It was kind of the main apple cultivated. And there was this doctor from Virginia named Thomas Walker who came up to join the British Army and the Americans, who were, this was, you know, pre-independence, uh, to fight the French and the Indians. He got there, they fought, the British and Americans got their hats handed to them by the French. Uh, most of the army was killed, the general was killed. A young lieutenant named George Washington kind of pulled the survivors together and helped them beat a quick retreat back to Virginia. Thomas Walker went with them, but before he went, he had noticed this, he had an orchard back in Charlottesville, and he had noticed this beautiful green apple everywhere. So he cut some, uh, cut some scion wood from the trees, stuck that wood in his saddlebags, and took it back to Virginia with him on the sly. And he had... Um, an estate called Castle Hill in Charlottesville. Went back to Charlottesville, planted his trees, raised this whole little orchard of Newtown Pippins, and went back to his doctoring practice. And, and one of his patients was his good friend Peter Jefferson, who was a local uh, plantation owner. A and I guess maybe he wasn't a very good doctor because certainly after he got there, Peter Jefferson died, <laughs> leaving Thomas Walker in ch as steward of Peter Jefferson's young son, Thomas Jefferson. So did Thomas Jefferson taste his first Newtown Pippin apple from the hands of Thomas Walker? Maybe. We have no proof, but almost definitely, I would say, because he was hanging out at Castle Hill, 
and Walker had just brought all the apples there. Um, we don't know for sure, but we do know that when Jefferson tasted the apple, he fell in love with it. <laughs> and, and so much so that as an adult, when he was uh, I- in uh, Paris, he wrote excitedly back to James Madison saying that they have no apples here to compare with our Newtown Pippin. He thought this could be a great crop for Virginia farmers, and um, they could ship it over to Europe, and it could be a, a real commercial enterprise. Uh, which it was, and pretty quickly, Pippin mania was still raging in England, and America was kind of the China of the day, in a way. The British had all these little tiny family orchards, and that, their whole apple industry was still very much at that small farm scale. America started creating the biggest orchards the world had ever seen, and they were importing, exporting all of these um, Newtown Pippins to England and swamping, and they were cheaper because it was much more efficient over here. They had the whole thing down, swamping the local market. So the British banned American apple imports to protect their local guys, which lasted until a young queen came along named Victoria. And um, the ambassador, when Victoria started her reign, when she was like 18, the ambassador to the U.S. was a guy named Andrew Stevenson, who was from Charlottesville and had a little orchard of his own where he raised pippins. So he, uh, he had some sent over with him, and he slid a basket of pippins to the queen. And guess what she thought? She fell in love with them. And word came back that they were eaten and praised by royal lips and swallowed by many aristocratic throats. So the, the young queen immediately lifted the ban on the Pippin, but only on the Pippin. No other apples were allowed to come in. And actually, um, Virginia kind of pulled a fast one on New York at this point because New York was still raising their apple and calling it the Newtown Pippin. But in Virginia, Charlottesville was the center of Pippin production, and that's Albemarle County. So they called it the Albemarle Pippin. So the Queen lifted the ban on the Albemarle Pippin, and New York had had a kind of a monopoly on the, the Pippin business, and then Virginia just started sending them all out of Baltimore to England, and that was pretty much the end of the Pippin in New York. But of course, then the Pippin came out this way, and it still holds on to a, a little, a few spots out there. It's used in Martinelli's uh, sparkling cider, among other things. But that's why the, the stories like that, the way apples spread around, that explains why not long after Johnny Appleseed's day, there were, the USDA estimated that there were over 7,000 varieties of apple in the U.S. And, of course, uh, I've been talking about fresh apples for a little while here, but quite a few of those apples had one purpose and one purpose only. They were for this guy. Uh, it's kind of, when I look at them now, I know that this just looks like your local barista now, but um, <laughs> this is what moonshiners used to look like. Uh, so, yeah, there, there were a lot of cider apples out there that were for nothing but cider because when you're making a good hard cider, you don't want to use fresh dessert apples because you ferment away the sweetness, turn it into alcohol, and the flavors that are left in a dessert apple are sometimes kind of weird to drink dry. They almost taste like perfume sometimes. So the cider apples were almost more like red wine grapes. They had a lot of tannins in them and other things that would turn into really interesting flavors and fe- mouthfeel when you made them into alcohol. So that, this was a big business back in the day, and uh, we tend to think of it as all, you know, like moonshiners and um, kind of backwood stuff, but it was a very, it was like the wine industry in Europe. It was very formal, and it was considered high-end. There was an apple called the Harrison that uh, Newark was famous for. The very first important apple book in the U.S. in 1817 referred to the Harrison as the most celebrated of the cider apples of Newark. Um, I know that that sounds weird to our ears. The most cel- cel- it's, it sounds like, you know, like the most celebrated of the Republicans of Marin County or something. <laughs> but Newark, back in the day, was first famous for its cider. It was called Newark Champagne. It was supposed to be competitive with champagne in terms of quality and sold for big bucks. You can still find the old bottles out there today of, this, of, that, of what was Newark Harrison cider. And if you look in the bottle, it'll say... Harrison Sparkling Newark Cider. And uh, not only did it compete with champagne, but it started being passed off as champagne, which was incredibly expensive to bring over. And it was kind of a, a scam. And people started referring to it as champagne. And uh, that wasn't the end for Newark 
cider in particular, but that whole world went kablooey not long after that uh, because the, the temperance movement got started and Carrie Nation started taking her, uh, her hatchet to bars and, <laughs> and apple trees and suddenly it became very uncool to be growing a, a, a type of apple that was only good for turning into alcohol. And we really lost most of our cider varieties and lost the whole tradition of drinking it. And so I, I sort of thought of this as a thought experiment for what that's like. Imagine that it happened with wine instead of cider. Imagine that we were the heirs of this culture that had revered the grape and had created a really sophisticated uh, civilization around making fine wine and passed it on through the ages down to us, but then say for that that whole world went away, like really went away, where it was no longer part of our culture whatsoever, where it had just been considered debauchery, right? So people got rid of it. It was not acceptable to have, have wine be a part of your life anymore. And maybe you would see a few remnants of that civilization here and there, where you'd, um, you know, you'd see some old vines, and people would say, like, oh, yeah, that's because people used to drink wine. But imagine it was that, that far gone, because that's how far gone cider was. Grapes, what if grapes just became kids' play? That's what apples became. There are a couple guys like this hiding out in the bush, maybe. <laughs> um, but and it, had, it was totally under the radar. I found this, I, I think this sign was maybe World War I era. I'm not sure, maybe a little later. But I like it because, you know, the, this mill is, is asking people to, if they've got cider apples, to send them to them because our boys want vinegar on their beans. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> That's what happened to the cider end of things. But what happened to the rest of the apples, to dessert apples, was in a way almost even worse. And uh, what happened was industrialization. That whole that whole era of farmers kind of being breeders and cultivating these cool old varieties went away. People stopped having self-sufficient farms. They started getting their apples from the store, and the store did not want to deal with tons of different apples coming from different places. They wanted one apple that they could stock everywhere that would last for months and months and months in storage. And what did they come up with? The enemy of our story. <laughs> the bad guy. The, uh, the evil red empire took over, and by the <laughs> 60s, 75% of the apples grown in America were red delicious, and we all know what they tasted like. They, they were sold because they were bright red, and people bought them. People consistently bought the redder apple over the better tasting apple, so the growers gave us what we wanted, or what it looked like we wanted. I think that's very sad. <laughs> Why? Because, well, I've been arguing for diversity, and I tried to think of what would be a good, what's a good way to think about what the loss of diversity brings. Because it's kind of, I mean, you can get by without a lot of different apples, but it's better with a lot of different apples. Think about Shakespeare. We could probably get by if we just had three plays of Shakespeare's that had come down to us. King Lear, Hamlet, and, you know, a light comedy called Honeycrisp or something. <laughs> but isn't it nice that we have 37 different plays of Shakespeare's? Even better, think about dogs. We could probably get by with three dogs, too, right? If you've got, like, a Great Dane, a Border Collie, and a Toy Poodle, then everybody gets something pretty close to what they want. It might not be exactly what would be the best one for you, but everybody's covered. But thank goodness there's a lot of Sharpays and Australian Sheepdogs out there, you know? Thank goodness there's a, a type of dog that's just right for everybody. And hopefully there are uh, going to be a lot more apples out there easily accessed. And that's happening now, because apples are extremely patient, long-lived beings. It's nothing for an apple tree to go 100 years. It'll even go 200 years, just kind of like waiting for us to come to our senses and turn around. So there are still apple trees out there th from the, that early era, from the early 1800s, of varieties that have been lost to us, or nearly lost. And all you need to do is find one of those trees and take a few shoots, and you can graft those shoots and bring that variety back into commercial circulation. And that's happened. There's a lot of apple collectors out there. There's actually some people right in this room who are a part of that who ha have all these apples 
available, apples that are unlike any of the ones we tend to taste in grocery stores. And stores are starting to come around and be willing to, to work with these apples. So it's a pretty exciting time. <laughs> and it's amazing what some of the collectors, the, the links they'll go to, to, to bring these apples back. There's this one guy I've written about named John Bunker, who is in Maine. And he, he has these um, great ways of finding the old apples. One is he'll, um, he goes through the old catalogs, the seed catalogs from, and the tree catalogs from the 1800s, and tries to figure out where in Maine these particular apples were. And he'll, he'll um, display w strange apples when he finds them. But the way he, he to get a new one is once he figures out the towns where an old apple used to be, because they were all so regional, usually just a town or two, he'll put up wanted posters for the apple um, it, with a description of the apple, where it was last seen, and if you know the whereabouts of this apple, contact Fedco, which is John's company. So then what happens is he goes to county fairs or historical societies and speaks, and whenever he does, he puts out this big spread of apples, which draws people's attention, just like the one out there did for us tonight. But then what's really going on is this line of people will appear. He's pretty well known in the state now, and this line of people will appear, every one of them with some mystery apple in their hands that came from like the back of the yard of the old farm that they just bought, or came from some roadside somewhere and they've been watching it for years, so they don't know what it is. And so it's almost like antique roadshow for apples, <laughs> where people will give, give him the apple and he'll look at it and ask them some questions, like, okay, where, where does it grow and what does the tree look like? And uh, when is it ripe and is it sweet? You know, he'll ask them lots of questions and look at it. And usually he'll just say, oh, you know, that's just a golden delicious with a lot of scab on it or something. But um, when he gets one of the ones he thinks might be one of these apples he's been tracking, he'll take the person's information. He does this with pears too. Write, you know, just write down their information and then take the apples back to, he's got every old apple book ever written, and we'll track it back. And then he'll go visit the people and the tree and try to identify it for sure. And he thinks he's brought about 80 different varieties back that were lost to us. And there's undoubtedly hundreds more out there. So what this means is that as heirlooms now have this new uh, the renaissance that's going on, we're going to start seeing apples so much better than what we've seen before for certain things. All the apples you tend to see out there in a store are dessert, what's called in the industry dessert apples. They're meant for eating fresh. There isn't a single apple out there, maybe you could, with the exception of Granny Smith, that's intended to be a baking specialist. But back in the day, they were apples that were baking specialists. You wouldn't want to eat them fresh, but they had a firmness to them and acidity and flavor that made pies pr better than anything you know, we see today with, with the fruit we have to work with. So there are um, some old varieties. Somebody today out there mentioned that Belle de Boscoop, an incredible strudel apple from Holland that is turning up more and more at farmer's markets. Uh, there, we're going to see some baked apples and pies that are truly phenomenal. Cider, too, is cool again. It is more than acceptable to be drinking cider again. I hope you guys enjoyed the one out there tonight. If, if not, check it out after this. Um, cider is so acceptable that, for instance, the Hudson Valley has seized on it as a way to save their uh, orchard culture that they still have because they haven't been able to compete on the commodity market, but they're, they're going hard into hard cider. And we don't know what is going to happen with cider right now. The whole cider world is kind of in the trajectory that the craft beer world was 20 years ago. It's following that same path straight up, like really exploding lately. So it's a pretty exciting time to, to, to pay attention to cider because it's wide open. Because we lost that tradition, there are no rules. And so everyone is all over the place trying barrel-aged ciders, flavored ciders, and ice ciders canned sort of English draft style ciders, cider aperitifs that are almost more like a vermouth. It's, we don't know what's going to end up being the, the right cider. There's not going to be a right cider. It's going to be everything. Sweet, dry. And that's, um, I haven't seen a brand new beverage come into being like that. Not brand new, but brand new to us. Also, we don't know what the right apples are going to be for it. This is a pretty exciting experiment. Uh, that Harrison apple that I mentioned, is, uh, was not quite lost. We thought it was gone, and then a fruit collector guy in the 1980s found one old tree in New Jersey 
grafted it, gave the, uh, the saplings and the scion wood to a few people, and now the first um, commercial crops of Harrison in probably 120 years are just coming into fruition. A few people are getting Harrison fruit. Like, no one even knew what the fruit would be like. So it's, it's almost as if we lost Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir disappeared from, from our, our culture, and then somebody found one and started growing it, and uh, you get to taste the wine for the first time. So look for Harrison ciders in maybe two years. The Pippin is alive and well, not just here, but there's a big nonprofit, well, not a big, a very tiny nonprofit, who's got a, a big plan to bring the Pippin back and make it the official apple of New York City. So there are young Pippin trees planted all over New York City now, back to its roots, and back to Castle Hill, where, where Thomas Walker brought it in the 1750s. There's a new cidery growing Pippins and making Pippin cider right where his plantation was. So yeah, my, my point is that uh, we're in the second age of the apple, and it's going to be a very exciting thing to watch, and I uh, hope you all will have a seat at the table and enjoy it. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. I know we all have questions. I know I have questions. So I'm going to ask the first one, and then if you raise your hand, I'll come to you. What's the best way to store them? That's a good question. Um, Fridge, it, the, if you get a really hard apple, like some of those traditional heirlooms, you actually want them to get soft. So you can actually, if you have a root cellar or somewhere else that's maybe, you know, 60 degrees, you can let it sit there and you'll just see how the flavor changes. But normally, apples straight out of the supermarket, they're, they'll be good in the fridge. They like For how long? Longer than you think. They'll go weeks. Can you graft multiple um, apple types onto the same tree so that, say, you have four types growing on one tree? Yeah, and actually all the old farmsteads used to have that. It was called a family tree. <laughs> and usually it would be right in the front yard. Every branch would be a different variety. I, and you, you'll see some of these collectors, they do that today. It looks crazy, you know, like the bottom of the tree will be red apples, and then you'll get a stripe of yellow apples and then green apples on top. It's really fun to do that, actually. I've done some of that in my house. How do you know if you're canning with vinegar, apple cider vinegar, if you use an organic apple cider vinegar, how do you know the acidity is enough for, how do you determine the acidity of, of apple cider vinegar? Um, if, it, if it doesn't say on it, I don't know an easy way to determine. I, I I'm not a canner, so I'd have to really kick that question out to any expert canners in the room. Anyone want to take field that? Go ahead. Right. Right, but cider vinegar is usually fermented out all the way. So you said that all apple trees are from graft, not, not from seeds? All the apples? Yeah, isn't that, that a shocker? Um, every, every Gravenstein on Earth is a clone of that first Gravenstein that was found somewhere in Denmark in the 1600s. So if we take the seeds from our apples, it's a whole new, we're going to get a whole new variety if it even grows. And then you get to name it after yourself. Cool. <laughs> Seriously. So how do they do those modern crosses like the John of Gold? How are they able to achieve that? Um, they, through trial and error, like... It's it's just like you know old fashioned. Is it flower to flower pollination? Yeah, yeah. Um, they'll they don't they don't let the bees do it. They bring it over themselves. But they'll do um, to get a new variety. They'll do like a hundred thousand crosses. It's uh, it used to take thirty years to um, to take a, a a new variety through all the steps and tests to make sure it would produce commercially and didn't have big disease problems. <coughs> Now they've sped that up a lot because they can actually sort of look at the genetics of it and see which traits it inherited and see if it inherited the ones they wanted it to inherit. But it's still, it's just trial and error. The Honeycrisp was like 
a shocker when it came along because they were not, it did not do what they were trying it to do. Like, you know how, how Honeycrisp has that unique texture, that ultra crisp thing? That was unknown to them. So actually, I have a quote in the book. A guy, uh, the, the guy, the breeder, when he tasted it, he says, I didn't know whether I had the worst apple or the best apple on my hand. It was like, so strange to him. So there's, there's all kinds of surprises out there. Um, is the USDA um, Extension Service or any of the land grant, originally land grant colleges, are they involved with trying to resurrect any of these varieties to help the local economies? Yeah, you know what they actually are. The USDA um, keeps this amazing orchard in Geneva, New York. They have over 2,000 varieties of apples. It's the biggest collection in the world. I kind of think of it as the best museum in the country that no one's ever heard of. It's just all their art, these art pieces happen to be living things, but you just walk walk through the rows and look around at all these strange apples, and it's fantastic. But what they did a few years ago, the, the apple is native to Kazakhstan. That's where it started, in these mountains called the Tian Shan Mountains, which means heavenly mountains. So I think of it as like the Garden of Eden, because there were apple forests covering these mountains, where about 60% to 70% of the trees were apple trees. So if you go there in fall, there's like forbidden fruit everywhere, right? Um, and that was um, what Europe and Asia used for their domestic apples, and then what we used, which we got from Europe. But the USDA went back to those forests back in the mid-90s to get the, those wild apples. They still exist, but they're being cut down for, you know, Russian dacas and stuff. So they went back and took tons and tons of samples Every, you know, every tree is different genetically up there. So they took all those samples back and grew like a wild Kazakh orchard in Geneva so that they would have all those new, those genes to use for disease resistance or whatever else might come along. So you can actually visit the one in Geneva and walk through the closest thing to the uh, Tian Shan Mountains, this side of Kazakhstan. that single through line in terms of um, the, the different um, varieties. Is there an increased um, a danger from a disease or p uh, pests uh, because of the very nature of the way they're propagated? There, there can be, and that's a problem with some of the, like Macintosh is famously really susceptible to scab. Think certain of the varieties will, be, uh, will have problems with a particular thing. But that's partly why they try, to, they try to get these, you know, Kazakh genes and crab apple genes and they mix those in to try to, you know, open up the gene pool for some of the new apples they're working on. Um, so are apple farmers just terrified about uh, bee colony collapses or do they have a plan B? No, they don't. That's, that's definitely a, an issue for them. They d it's not as bad for them as it is with the almond guys. They don't need that many, but they did, th They all need their apples. Without apples, you don't, I mean, without bees in most places, you don't, unless you have wild bees around, you don't get a really good crop. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, as some of the like larger California and Washington uh, orchards are starting to pick up on some of these heirloom varieties, do you see any danger in that? Or do you think that that's like generally a good thing that, that larger, you know, that they're starting to be like, packing house pink pearls and... Right, right. Um, I don't see any danger for us. It's unless, uh, like, yeah, I think that's probably all to the good. There are uh, the new varieties that the breeders come out with, the breeding programs use, are all now trademarked, patented. They're intellectual property. So there's a danger there. Uh, like Pink Lady was the very first apple uh, to have that, where you're, it's almost like Monsanto. They tell you the grower, how you can grow the apple, and you can't graft it, right, is my understanding. Um, you're not allowed, it's their intellectual property, so you're not allowed to make more trees like people have done for 3,000 years. But, uh, so that's, a, that's kind of an unnerving trend in, in the commercial world. But yeah, no, I think heirlooms, I, I think it's good because one thing I've noticed is that we have, a, if you have your expectation of what an apple is and it departs from that, you don't like it. It's like if you're expecting a cup of tea and you get coffee, or you're expecting coffee and you get tea, it just tastes wrong. 
Uh, if you're expecting an apple to be a honey crisp, super duper crisp, explodes in your mouth like a fruity Cheeto, anything that doesn't do that, it tastes a little weird. But there's a lot of different things that an apple can be and be really good. So I think it's great if um, there's more different kinds of apples out there. Hi. Are there uh, like cultural eating trends for how someone eats an apple? Like, do certain places eat the whole core and save the core or <laughs> skin it or slice it in a certain way over time? That is a great question. I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to start paying attention to that. <laughs> I, it, yeah, skin versus no skin is an interesting one. I have a birds and bees question. If the bees are flying around and picking up pollen from different varieties, how do you keep the purity of the apple produced on each of the trees? You don't. That's the thing. Is That's why each seed is, um, is not the same variety as its parent. You, you have to clone it. You take a, a, sh a little shoot off of the actual tree and graft it onto a rootstock, and that tree that grows will be genetically identical. It's asexual reproduction. If you let sex it, take care of it, you're going to get something totally different. <laughs> Does everyone get that? Everyone yeah. good with that? You know what? That's that's because um, if the the fruit if if they get pollinated, then they're going to make seeds. Then they're basically pregnant, so they're going to make seeds, and they don't want that. They want seedless aren't the the clementines. <laughs> they need to keep them sterile. You know. Um, if I could tie this to Rosh Hashanah, since it, this is why you're here, one of the reasons why you're here, uh, Lenore mentioned that you've been asked to do something on uh, apple and honey pairing. I'm wondering if you've started experimenting yet, and if you have, if you have any specific recommendations, and also what kind of apple would you recommend for apple cake? Oh, good question. Um, yeah, well, no, you know, the Washington Post called me today out of the blue uh, and said, you know, what, so what honey, how, how do you pair honey and apples? What goes with what? So I was like, I really haven't thought about it. But uh, I, so I just, I just kind of winged it. But um, I thought about it, and I thought, like, honeys, uh, there's different kinds of honeys, but I mean, they're all super sweet. So I would think rule one is you want a tart apple to go with your honey, right, to get that kind of nice contrast between the sour and the sweet. So something like a wine sap would be ideal, or a pippin would be great. Pippin is kind of perfect. And uh, so, yeah, I guess like the California pairing would be like Pippin with wildflower honey or with orange blossom honey. That might be, you know, apples and oranges. How about that? She, al she also asked about um, the best apple for oh, apple sorry, cake. Oh, sorry, apple cake. Yeah. Well, do you want firm apples in your apple cake or do you want uh, tender apples? I think for, I don't know. Pie, I pie definitely for, although uh, for, to make a great apple pie, you really want like five different kinds of apples. That's the key to a good pie is some firm, some sweet, some tart, one that's a little more gluey to kind of glue everything together. But Which one's gluey? Well, Bramley's seedling. Somebody, somebody's growing Bramley's seedling out there, right? Is he still here? Is Johan here? No. Okay. Um, Hidden Star Orchard, they're growing Bramley seedling, which is the pie apple in England. But like the French like a really firm apple in their pie like we do. But in England, Bramley seedling is a really gluey apple that it kind of breaks down and makes more of a paste. So when Johann's Bramley seedlings are ready in a couple of years, I'd, I'd grab one of those. But Macintosh actually breaks down pretty well too. So when I was a kid in Pennsylvania, we used to go out to the country and get golden delicious apples. And they were picked fresh off the tree and they were wonderful. I don't see those apples anymore. What happened? Yeah, you, uh, you nailed it. Golden delicious, which is now one of the other apples we kind of make fun of, was considered one of the greatest apples that had ever been found. When uh, it was considered so good, the, the nursery, the, this one farmer discovered it showed it to a local nursery. They bought the apple off of him for $5,000 and a 900-foot plot of land around the apple. And they put up an electric cage around it so that nobody could steal, you know, could get a graft off of it. So they would have a monopoly on the Golden Delicious. 
And they did. They made a million dollars off the apple. And it was really crisp. It was almost like the honey crisp of its day. Beautiful kind of melony sweetness. That, those apples were coming off of a tree in sunny places. And now almost all the golden delicious come from places that aren't quite th that warm. It was a southern apple originally. It was West Virginia uh, where it got started. And um, they pick them green now because they want them to last in storage. So it shouldn't look, a golden delicious should be really yellow, like bright yellow. And if it's bright yellow, actually I had a golden delicious yesterday in Sebastopol, California. That was the best apple I'd tasted in a long time. It was fully ripe, really crisp, straight off the tree. It was beautiful. And that's probably what you were getting back in the day. So farmers, I, I'd say like pick your own and farmer's market golden delicious is going to be a lot better than the store golden delicious. Makes a big difference with that one. I, I just wanted to say something in my mother's memory. She d wrote a cartoon when she was a teenager, um, and nobody got it, but I think this audience will. It was a picture of a Confederate soldier sleeping under a tree, and it said, don't sleep under the apple tree. It might be a northern spy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the northern spy apple was named for uh, an abolitionist novel back in the pre-Civil War days. It was very inflammatory, apparently. So th there you go. Somebody had a hand here. Here we go. If the apple propagation is mostly asexual, the grafting that you were talking about, why is it important then to have the bees be vibrant for that particular crop? I mean, um, because th that's necessary for them to make the actual apple. Like, if they don't get pollinated, they won't produce fruit. So the fruit they they produce the same fruit type of fruit every year. But the seeds inside will not, would not make that fruit because they have a different genetic mix. But the mother tree has, you know, she always makes the same fruit. Any more questions? I have one, one last one. Um, um, I was, um, your book has all these extraordinary photographs and recipes and all this wonderful history. And I was looking at all the recipes, and it's full of savory recipes. Can, um, did you, how did you come about some of those recipes? Are they yours? Did you experiment? Because there's some unusual uses for apples, which I'm looking forward to copying. Yeah, that was one of my goals. Because while well, there's lots of great sweet recipes for apples out there, but I've, I've always thought that they work really well in various savory dishes. So I kind of put a big emphasis on the savory dish, dishes in my recipe section just to really get people to start thinking about different things to do with apples. You can make a great apple salsa where they, uh, if it's a nice, really tart apple, it almost takes the place of the lime in salsa. It's really good. Stuff like that. Um, and yeah, everyone, you should definitely just feel free to look through the book. A lot of photos in there, and, and I will be signing copies. And he'll be out there to, to sell them and to, for you to look at them. And everybody, please join me in thanking Rowan Jacobson. <laughs> <laughs>